Good morning, Salina High School. Um, first of all, I want to say I know that most of you have had some sort of Holocaust teaching, mostly in eighth grade, and so I thought this is something that can affect everyone here. Um, and there's a lot of stuff with the Holocaust in the news right now, so it's important that we learn from past mistakes. Um, my college tennis coach actually knows Alex here, and that's how I was able to bring Alex uh, to you guys today. So here's a little on Alex. Alex is the son of uh, Michael or Mickey Kaur and the late Eva Moses Kaur, both survivors of the Holocaust. Alex speaks to keep his mother's message alive. He is a podiatrist, that's a foot doctor for those of you that don't know that, in Carmel, Indiana, and a Butler University graduate. He's a bulldog too, uh, where he played college tennis. He is volunteering his morning off as a doctor to speak to you guys. His mother, Eva, became famous for telling her story of being a Dr. Mangala experimental twin with her sister, Miriam. They were only 10 when they were imprisoned. She also gained notoriety for asking a Nazi doctor to travel with her to Auschwitz, and she publicly forgave him in her name only. The Candles Museum in Terre Haute, Indiana, was founded by the Gore family and acts as a museum of peace and forgiveness today. Everyone welcome Dr. Alex Gore. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. You can hear me good? So uh, if, if nobody here has seen a grown man cry, you're probably going to see that today. So I have Kleenex, I've got water, I've got coffee. Um, so my name is Alex Kaur, and um, I'm going to try to spend about 30, 35 minutes talking to you, and then I would welcome any questions that you have. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, you have to leave at 9. So let me... Let me give you a little background. So what's the Holocaust? What's Auschwitz? So during World War II, over 75 years ago, there was um, a big world war. And part of that was, uh, part of the process was they rounded up Jews, just to be simple, in Europe and killed them. And um, six million Jews were killed at Auschwitz. Auschwitz, as somebody correctly said, is in Poland. There were many, many other camps. My dad was one, in one of the other camps. They both survived, and by a miracle, here I am. So I am the son of the late Eva Moses Kaur and, and Mickey Kaur. My dad died two days ago. Uh, my parents are both survivors of the Holocaust. Um, my mom sadly passed away during one of our trips to Krakow, Poland, to Auschwitz, um, July 4th, 2019. Uh, my father, who I just mentioned, would have been 96 this Sunday. And um, he loved playing the piano, loved his Purdue Boilermakers, and always listened to Dean Martin. Um, my mom survived nine torture-filled months at the hands of a, of a doctor, Joseph Mengele. Mengele did experiments on, on twins, essentially, and this was done at Auschwitz. Uh, well, my father was liberated. After escaping a death march, uh, he was liberated by a United States Army unit under the command of Lieutenant Colonel Andrew Neff. Andrew Neff hailed from all places, this place called Terre Haute, Indiana. Basketball fans may know that's where Larry Bird played college basketball. The liberation came after my father survived uh, what's known as the ghetto, the Riga ghetto. And he lived almost four years in a number of concentration camps including Stutthof and Buchenwald, where he was liberated near. Liberated means you were freed. Again, a lot of, when I hear, talk to students, they'll say, well, how come they went there? Well, they didn't have a choice. You know, they were told to go or you were killed. My parents over the years have dealt with their experiences in very, very different ways. Um, and really, never was this more evident when I was your age, in 1978, and I'm aging myself, when um, our family was asked to appear um, at a local NBC TV affiliate in Terre Haute where they were uh, showing the miniseries Holocaust. Uh, the year before, the famous series Roots was on TV. The following year on NBC, uh, there was a series called Holocaust. This was uh, shown nationally and we were at the local NBC affiliate in Terre Haute. My mother was asked to appear on local television that night after the last uh, part of the series to talk about her experiences relative um, to the miniseries. Well, my sister, I have a younger sister, my dad and I watched, looked on. 
And this really was probably my mom's first appearance in a public way talking about her experiences. In one of the last scenes of, of the movie, there's a little boy kicking a soccer ball. I didn't think it was a big deal. I looked over at my father and I see him crying hysterically. And, you know, as a 17 year old, um, I had never seen my dad cry. And I didn't really, until that point, realize the pain that this scene had triggered. Uh, kind of conversely, with my, my mom's uh, emotions in check, she was able to tell her story, you know, during the segment on the evening news. And I kind of left as a 17 year old, kind of thinking, I need to. I had a new awareness, I should say, and that awareness was that I needed to help my father kind of deal with his past and encourage my mom to kind of continue to tell her story and perfect her story, more of a polished speaker. And since that memorial, uh, memorable experience in 1978, my mom and my father continued on their respective paths. My mother was able to become more of a polished speaker and kind of piece together her past, and my dad um, kind of developed into doing his own thing over a period of time. And, and I was really, quite frankly, my mom's harshest critic. And so when I was in sixth grade, she gave a lecture and it was really bad. She cried all the way through it. But over the years, she became a pretty nice speaker. And as I said, my father, on the other hand, continued. He was a pharmacist. He went to Purdue School of Pharmacy. Uh, kind of like his low-key personas, he would tell people. He rarely wanted to discuss his ghetto and concentration camp experiences, even when my sister and I asked him to kind of open up. We didn't understand, you know, why, um, and he didn't understand why people wanted to know such a sad story. He would, he would tell people that, in his mind, his story was like a black and white movie that the audience would run out because they would be sick and would want to leave the, the theater after the preview. He never really realized, at this point in my life, the impact that his story had on, on me and, and really other people. However, however, over a period of time, as my mother became more and more, of a, more and more outspoken, and my mom was very outspoken, I can tell you stories, I noticed my dad becoming more and more comfortable with the idea of talking and gradually kind of letting his guard down. And uh, when my mother, my mother opened the Candles Holocaust Museum and Education Center in Terre Haute, Indiana in 1995, my dad had just retired as a pharmacist. So he reluctantly agreed, volunteered one day a week, and a, really a good day for him would be no visitors, nobody would come in, he could listen to his favorite political radio show and get ready for the next Purdue football or basketball game. But one day a small class um, with a substitute teacher visited the Candles Holocaust Museum. They thought my mom would be there. And my dad was there and my mom was unavailable. So that day my dad gave his first lecture. and. Um, that was not his last. He became a regular one o'clock speaker two days a week. And he would always, at the beginning of every lecture, he would always say, I really don't like talking about this. But 45 minutes later, you couldn't get him to stop. Was, as he would say, it was like a faucet. You turn on and all the emotions would run out. And he would always finish his performance with, a, with his speech with a piano performance because he thought this was a good way to, you know, evoke emotion and he thought this would be a good way for people to remember um, his, his speech. Um, my mother's twin sister, um, and again, my mom had a twin, so most children, just to go back a little bit, when they were taken to concentration camps, if they were not strong enough to work, women and children were killed immediately. Younger men and adult men were allowed to work and they lived. Um, so my mom was nine, nine or ten years old when she was taken to the camp. Why was she allowed to live? She was a twin. She was a Mangala twin, meaning that Mangala would, when they got off the train at Auschwitz, they would look for twins. And my mom and my aunt were always dressed identical. And so, because they were twins, they were not killed immediately. They were used in medical experimentation. So, my mother's twin sister, Miriam, passed away in June of 1993. And we can talk about why, but more than likely it was related to the experiments. The pain of this loss was more than likely one of the driving reasons for my mom to search for answers to a challenging and very difficult past. She didn't have all the answers in 1993. So months after my aunt passed away, my mother met with a Nazi doctor, Dr. Hans Munch in Germany. Hans Munch was the only Nazi doctor that had been acquitted of war crimes and then he returned to practice medicine after his trial. My mom was very nervous about this rendezvous, 
And she realized that he wasn't like all the other Nazis. He, he was nice. He said he had nightmares about his experiences. And one of the things he did was he kept up, he kept alive during the experiments, his experiments, 20 some Jews didn't kill anybody. And those 20 some Jews, when after the war, testified on his behalf and he was allowed to be acquitted. After my mom met him in, in 1993, my mother asked Dr. Munch if, if he would come with us to Poland, January 1995, which would be the 50th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. And because of revisionists, people who don't think the Holocaust occurred, because of a revisionist then and now that deny the Holocaust, my mother really was a very innocent thing. She wanted to have a document signed by a Nazi to attest to these atrocities. To our great surprise, Munch agreed to make, make this trip. So my mom goes back to Terre Haute, Indiana, thinking, wow, this is pretty, pretty, pretty special. So for the next 18 months, she kind of thought, you know, how can she think of a way to thank him? So once she went to the local Hallmark store in Terre Haute, and everybody knew her in town, and she's looking around. My mom was like, on a good day, like four foot 11, always dressed in blue. Eva, what are you looking for? And she didn't have the courage to say, well, I'm looking for a card for a Nazi. That didn't, she goes, well, I'm just looking. I'm just kind of looking. So my parents never drank alcohol. She didn't really know what champagne to get. So, you know, so a champagne and a greeting card from Hallmark weren't appropriate. Really couldn't think of anything that would, would, would be ideal for this. Then one day, as my mom would say, she would get her great ideas when she was cooking, shopping, and, and, and doing dishes. So one day she was doing the dishes, and this idea came to her just to forgive Dr. Mooch, this, this Nazi doctor. She didn't have any interactions with Dr. Mooch while at Auschwitz, but she had met him and um, really liked him, and he was going to come to Auschwitz to attest to these atrocities. So she was going to forgive Dr. Mooch in her name only. And that's very important because a lot of people still to this day, even after my mom died, claim that my mom forgave on other people's behalf, and she never did. She forgave in her name only Dr. Munch's role at Auschwitz. And this seemed to my mom like the perfect idea. And she realized that initially this was a very important gift for Dr. Munch, but not until later did she realize that this was very significant for her own well-being. By forgiving a Nazi in her name only, she was lifting this incredible burden of pain that had haunted her for 50 years. So as her harshest critic, <laughs> and she was, I was kind of her sounding board, um, I didn't always agree with my mom, and, but she would listen to me. She didn't listen to a lot of other people. And so when, I told, when she told me of this idea, I said, Mom, I'm not sure this is a great idea. I said, you're going to get a lot of resistance. People aren't going to, you know, I think you're going to have trouble with this. And typical to my mom, she didn't care about anybody else. She cared, she thought this was the right thing for her, and her way or the highway, didn't really matter. So um, since 1995, um, you know, I knew that my mom's decision to forgive was controversial um, and, you know, has done so much good locally, but also throughout the world. She ultimately, and this initial forgiveness with Dr. Munch, she also ultimately forgave Dr. Mengele. Dr. Mengele was never found again. And I can tell you stories, but he was thought to, the bones, his bones were thought to have been found in South America. And so, you know, over the years, I've learned many, many valuable lessons, you know, from my parents' past, which have really served me very well. From my father, um, very important for him to always be honest. He was almost too honest. Um, you know, I can remember once we were in D.C., and I was a little kid, we were driving, and he wanted, he was thirsty, we were driving, and he said, well, I need a drink of water. So, so he was afraid there was a policeman driving past and he drank a little water. He goes, oh my God, the guy, policeman thought it was probably whiskey. I said, D Dad, don't worry. I mean, he was so honest. Hardworking. My dad was very, very hardworking. And these are all life lessons that you as high school students should, should hopefully take, take home. Be humble. And my dad was very, very humble, almost to a fault. And my dad also was very, very polite. He always said thank you almost to his dying day. Um, and if you're ever, if there's a very nice article, if you go to Tribstar, T-R-I-B star.com in the tarot paper yesterday about my dad, it's a great story. Um, be tough. Um, and really, you know, in the last few years, uh, my mom died a little over two years ago, and my dad's 
been in assisted living from July 2016 until he died two days ago, I've really witnessed how tough my father is. And everybody thought my mom was tough, which she was. Um, and this was a very visible attribute of my mother. And my dad was also as tough as they came. And, and a lot of people, friends of mine, would say that my dad had the heart of a lion, uh, but the soul of a poet. And there's a lot of lessons, you know, from my mother. Um, and first and foremost, you know, never give up. And, you know, in 1987, I, Alex Kaur, was diagnosed with cancer. I tell a lot of people that I have something in common with Lance Armstrong. No, I didn't do PEDs. No, I didn't date Sheryl Crow. I didn't win the Tour de France. What I have in common with Lance Armstrong is that we were both treated at Indiana University Medical Center for testicular cancer. So in 1987, while in podiatry school, I had cancer. And, um, you know, I was scared. I was 26 years old. And my mom said, you know, I'm a survivor. Your dad's a survivor. And you'll be, you'll be cancer and you'll be a survivor. And she was right. Number two lesson from my mom is prevent prejudice by judging people only on their actions and the content of their character. Um, this is very important for you even in high school. Um, and, you know, at, at a young age in 1968, after Martin Luther King and, and Robert Kennedy were assassinated, my mother started a daycare center at Height Community Center. It's an African, predominantly African-American community center in Terre Haute. And as a young seven-year-old, um, and continued throughout my life, you know, my mom taught me to see really past the color of someone's skin, past the, the clothes they wear, past their religion, and to only pay attention to their actions, character, and their heart. Probably my mom's most well-known life lesson, which I think is important, is forgive your worst enemy. It will heal your soul and set you free. It's still very debated. Two weeks after my mom died, I had to, uh, there was an op-ed in the Washington Post that was incorrect, but um, this is still very debated. And I contend, you know, that my mom's decision to forgive probably not only saved and extended her life, but also has allowed others uh, another option when dealing with an adverse situation. And, you know, hopefully none of us have to contend or deal with such, such a terrible thing like the Holocaust. But I do think that many of us, you know, let's say Johnny is dating Julie and Johnny cheats on Julie. Maybe instead of Julie getting mad at Johnny, forgiveness should be something that is, is thought about. My mom would tell many of you that, you know, when we're younger, in grade school, we learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. But my mom should all, would also say, well, you really need to learn you know, how to forgive. I think that's important. And it doesn't come from a religious background. My mom, I'm Jewish, um, but you know, a lot of people would say, oh, she, she, this is from a religious background. No, it's, it's because she did it really to save her own life. And she kind of stumbled upon it. I can tell you more about it. Um, for, for all of you to give your parents an extra hug and kiss for children like my mom who had no parents. And, you know, uh, I've always cherished uh, the time that I spent with my parents. My mom died at the age of 85, and my dad died at the age of 95 Tuesday. Each of us has an important part to play in repairing the world. Um, there's a Hebrew saying, Tukum Alam, be the change that you wish to, to see. Change happens when people take positive action. Don't be a bystander. And, you know, unfortunately, um, Holocaust survivors are becoming a casualty of time. Uh, unfortunately, each day the world loses another Holocaust survivor. Each day we, as a society, lose another witness to this terrible thing that happened. Each day I feel a greater obligation to continue, you know, my mom's work and tell her story. And, you know, each day I've had a greater urgency to serve as a voice for my father. So uh, my mom, every year we would go to Auschwitz. I've been to Auschwitz over 20 times. I, this started when I was 24, it was 1985. Uh, the last time I went with my mom was July uh, 2019. So two nights before she passed away, we're sitting in our hotel room, I'm working, and she's, I don't know, she always liked working on her cell phone. She, I think she was tweeting, and she had 30-some thousand. We still had the account open, but she loved to tweet. She was like, when we were on airplanes, she would grab her phone as soon as we got off the plane and see who tweeted back. And, I can tell you a lot of funny stories about Twitter and my mom. But so I said in the hotel room, I said, Mom, you know, you're getting a little older. Maybe you should, you know, kind of slow down a bit. 
And she said, responded by saying, slow down, what are you talking about? I've, I still have a lot of work to do. My job is not done yet. And let me just say this, you know, two weeks ago or so in South Lake, Texas, there was a teacher that said that opposing views to the Holocaust should be allowed to be included in, in education. And, you know, something like that really hits home for me because I think it's very important that we never forget. I think it's very important that we use these terrible things in the past to prevent future atrocities. And so when my mom said my work is not done yet, this was two days before she died, this even now, two, almost two and a half years later, still rings true. So I think about this last conversation with my mom every day. Um, during the last week of, of her life, uh, she had finalized remarks that she wanted to give January 27th, uh, 2020, which was the 75th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. She wanted to, to do this speech. Um, she unfortunately died July 4th, 2019. So um, these remarks, I'm gonna say several of them now, she never had this opportunity to give that one last and important speech. So here today, I'd like to give you some of those ideas from my mom, which I think are very important um, life, leg life lessons, and I think the, the legacy hopefully will live forever. I'm going to read a portion of that speech as if I'm my mother. I'm here today to declare that we, we still have much work to do. Much of the world around us is in turmoil with hate crimes, anti-Semitic violence at a level not seen since World War II. It is in part due to the constant and current world situation that my active responsibility to share my memories in an effort to educate the world with the hope that this education will keep another Auschwitz from happening feels more urgent than ever. There is nothing I can do to change my past, but I can change my future and hopefully that of others. Again, my mom saying this, saying never again is not enough. We must act with definite purpose and a common goal for the sake of ourselves and others. It is up to us to actively teach today's world, especially our youth, why respect and common decency for everyone, regardless of race, religion, or any other difference is so vitally important. And until we use that education to begin to heal our own wounds over the most basic level and allow ourselves, the former prisoners, to be free of the pain of our tragic past, we will never truly be free. It is my opinion, again, as my mother, it is my opinion that by being free of the pain, survivors ensure their eternal peace and fortify their abilities to reach out and educate others with their memories. In my life, in my mom's life, I have met with survivors and perpetrators as well as children and grandchildren and new generations of hundreds of Germans born with children, born children who all share one thing. That one thing is guilt. For some reason, this guilt was because of memories of, of others' actions. This guilt is because of the knowledge and memories of other individuals who they did not know, grandparents, great-grandparents. Nothing positive has developed in them because of this guilt. But yet the human interactions with generations of Germans long removed from the Holocaust have been, for me, incredibly, incredibly powerful and positive. I leave you with one question. How do we use our memories today to change the course of events for future generations living long past our own mortalities? We all have the power within us which we can use to answer this question for the betterment of humanity. My power from within is forgiveness as a way to heal and empower myself. I suggest that we all have that power to forgive those who have wronged us not for the benefit of them, but because all of us finally deserve to live free in a way that allows us to share our memories without reliving the unbearable and agonizing pain of our past with every spoken word or shared memory. By doing so, we challenge any perpetrator, possible perpetrator, or denier of today or the future by empowering ourselves and others with the undeniable and unforgettable truth of what happened here in Auschwitz each and every day. 
our memories will provide the necessary fuel to light the way to hope, healing, understanding, goodwill, and peace for humanity. Like our vivid memories, the horrible crimes against us and millions of others can never be washed away or forgotten. But how we deal with those terrible memories is our choice. Let there be a new beginning which includes hope for mankind and let it begin with us. So here in Salina, Ohio on October 21, as the son of two Holocaust survivors, you know, we solemnly remember all victims of the Holocaust, six million Jews, 1.5 million of those were children, as well as five million non-Jews, including dwarfs, homosexuals, and gypsies who lost their lives. May their memories be a blessing to us all. However, as my mom proclaimed, we must use these memories that come from the painful experience to make the world better now and for future generations. You know, when I hear that, it sounds like a daunting task. Make the world better. How can I do that? And more importantly, how can you do that? It's a big task. So, you know, over the years, I've heard my mom lecture probably thousands of times. Um, and, you know, I have a, a lot of, there are a lot of recommendations. And some of these are very simple, straightforward ideas that you can take home and try just to make the world a better place. So, number one, think of one thing that you can do every day to make the world a better place. This really sounds simple, and, and it really is. My mom would urge you to you know, pick up garbage if you see it on the gym floor. Open a door for somebody if they're carrying a package. Um, befriend someone in your school cafeteria who's sitting alone or, and stand up to bullying, which my mom was also very much against bullying. Number two, be the best you can be. As a high school student, as you prepare, prepare for a test or a lecture, you can only do your best. And my mom, you know, I would have a tennis match or I would have a s test. And my mom said, you know, at the end of the day, you can only do your best. So be the best you can do day in and day out, no matter what. Number three, um, on my emails, I have this. I want my time on this earth to count for something. Do not, do not just exist. Try to leave a positive impact on other people. Not negative, positive. Number four, I have the human right to be happy and free from my tragic past. Everyone deserves to, to live a happy life free from the effects of trauma. Number five, my memories are the source of my strength and the motivation for my actions. Forgiving is not the same as forget, forgetting. A lot of people criticize my mom for that. It is not forgetting. My mom couldn't forget. I can't forget. Memories can fuel positive actions. Number six, Make yourself good, make yourself feel good by being kind. Uh, there's a Mayo Clinic study that says kindness has been shown to increase self-esteem, self empathy, and compassion. It can decrease blood pressure and be a healthier thing for all of us. Number seven, prejudice is a cancer of the human soul. Number eight, getting even never helped a single person. Number nine, Anger is a seed for war. Forgiveness is a seed for peace. Number 10, forgiveness is really nothing more than an act of self-healing and self-empowerment. My mom would call forgiveness a miracle of medicine. It is free, it works, and it has no side effects. And she would often say, you know, if you don't like how forgiveness makes you feel, you can always take it back and be angry again. So in 1966, during a visit to South Africa, the late Robert F. Kennedy, one of my mom's idols, this were, might be where you get the positive Kleenex sign. Um, each time a man, this is Robert Kennedy, each time a man stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope, each ripple crossing uh, um, another ripple allowing for a million centers of energy and daring those ripples building a common current which can sweep the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. My mother shared a similar philosophy and would often use Kennedy's ripple effect to talk to kids, even as young as six or seven years old. She, says, she would say, if I throw a pebble in a lake, there's a ripple. 
If two children throw two pebbles in a lake, there are two ripples. If a hundred children throw a hundred pebbles in a lake, this will be like a wave. And there's ripple touching ripple. So I hope my words today will be the first ripple in that symbolic lake, creating a ripple that will reach your ripple, and that together we can create a wave, a wave that continues to the work of my mom and my dad and other survivors like them, helping the world remember the lessons that desperately want us, that they desperately want us to learn, understand, and, and put in practice. There's a, a movie about my mother, and I think some of you have seen it, Eva A-7063, it was done in Indianapolis by Ted Green Films and WFYI. At the very end of the movie, my mom uh, looks to the heavens and says to her mom, sorry, says, sorry, she says to her mom, I will tell your story, sorry, I will tell your story, I hope you're proud of me. Today, I echo those same sentiments. Mom, I'll tell your story. I hope you're proud of me. Thank you very much. I um, really appreciate it. As you can imagine, um, I didn't know I'd come today, but I'm glad I did. So, I welcome questions. I don't know how you want to do the questions, but I'm happy to uh, answer any questions. Thanks. Thanks. So I have a strong voice, so you, uh, thank you very much. You can ask me anything. I can tell you funny jokes. I can tell you stories. We have football players here. I can tell you how my parents and sports combine. So if you have no questions, you're going to have me doing a comedy act for about 22 minutes. Questions? Why don't you, why don't you come out here and then I'll repeat the question because not everybody's going to hear it. And I'll repeat it. I'll repeat it. Thank you. Would there be any way we can help with this? Like spread this word? Well, that's a great. What's your name? Gavin Shaw. Gavin Shaw. Is there any way you can help with this? Um, I think the first thing, Gavin, is to try to do the simple things that my mom would, would say. You know, be nice to your fellow student. Stop bullying in your school. If somebody's in the cafeteria sitting alone, try to befriend them. But you know, you're young. What year are you? Yeah, so when I was a junior in high school, I didn't know what my future would be. All I wanted to do was play tennis and have a girlfriend. So, you know, I think those are the, you know, those are important things. But the point is, I think as you get older, hopefully this experience and others, you can remember, oh, yeah, when I was a junior in high school, I heard Alex Kors speak. Um, I think try to do things that are positive. Try to, you know, if somebody, if there's, graffiti in your town, try to speak against it. If there's negative things in your, in your community, at your church, whatever, I think just try to be a voice, a positive voice, and I think that's a good start. I don't think my mom, if she were here, would say, yeah, you should, uh, you know, you should go, to, go to the United Nations and protest. Or, I think let's, let's keep it simple. You need to learn about yourself and how you would respond to situations. But that's a great question. Nobody's ever asked me that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Huh? No, that's fine. I'm good. Any other? Yes. You're limping. I'm a podiatrist. No, go ahead. Um, how do? How can we in this community where the uh, Jewish population isn't super high? How do we address anti-Semitism? How do we in this community where the Jewish population is small? How do we address anti-Semitism? Well, you have smart kids here. My gosh, I thought this would be easy. I could tell the jokes a lot easier than... Um, another great question. You know, I, I think one thing, you can speak out against any type of hate. It doesn't have to be against Jews. It can be against people with blonde hair. It can be against certain, you know, religions. I think it starts small. And so you don't have to, 
necessarily speak out against anti-Semitism. I think the biggest thing is anybody that's singled out for their color of their skin, the color of their hair, their religion, whatever, should in some way be told that that's wrong. And I think, you know, if you do want to learn about um, the Jewish tradition, Jewish faith, and anti-Semitism, I think there's a Holocaust Museum in, in, in um, Detroit. I will just put a plug in. Um, my parents started the Campbell's Holocaust Museum and Education Center uh, in Terre Haute, Indiana. We've obviously had a pandemic. My mom passed away, so we've had some struggles. Uh, but the museum is still, still an entity. I'm, I'm now on the board. Uh, there is another opportunity a little closer to you. In March of 2022, there'll be an exhibit in uh, downtown Indianapolis at the Indiana Historical Society dedicated to my mom. Um, so I think there's a lot of opportunities, and nowadays with the Internet, you can learn a lot. You can also learn a lot of bad things on the Internet. But I think the point is that you start in your own community, similar to both questions, and try to make your community better, whether it's... Um, you know, going to a park and cleaning the park or whatever. I don't think you have to think great, big scale yet. Let's start with simple things, but another great question. Thank you. Can you shout? Well, there was no internet dating in 1959. Um, so, my, uh, my dad was rescued by an American GI from Terre Haute, Indiana. So my dad, at the age of 20, which really was 16, but he was 20, went to high school. Um, and I'll give you a little long version of the story. So my dad decided to enroll at Indiana State Teachers College, which became Indiana State University. So my dad, on a good day, was about five foot two, and he, he loved, he became a very big fan of basketball, because we all know that Indiana basketball is king, right? So, my father heard that the basketball coach for Indiana State University was also the, the gym teacher. So at five foot two on a good day, he took the class. So the teacher would teach him hook shots. Well, that teacher was somebody by the name of John Wooden. Yes, the John Wooden. Uh, John Wooden, for those of you, uh, was two years in Indiana State, then got the job at UCLA. He's won 10 national titles. Uh, when NCAA teams, when they uh, win the championship, they get the John Wooden Trophy. That was my dad's gym teacher. So after two years at Indiana State, my dad finally got accepted to pharmacy school at Purdue. Um, he finished his pharmacy school. One of my dad's older brothers was living in Israel. My mom and my aunt, after they were liberated and went back to their village, realized that their parents and two older sisters had been killed. They were 10 years old. Uh, and aunt took them in, and um, that part of the world became communist after World War II. So my mom went from living in Nazi Germany to communism. So by the age of 15, an aunt finally got a visa to go to Israel. And so they entered, my mom and my aunt ended up in Israel. My mom was in the Israeli army in 1956, Sergeant Major. She was always very proud. And uh, at that time, my mom's twin was about to get married. And so my mom felt like an old hag at the age of 27. And she had a relationship, and the family didn't like her because she had no family because they were killed in the Holocaust. And so my dad came to visit his brother in Israel, and they met on a blind date. And my mom would tell a story. My mom's English was bad. My dad's Hebrew was bad. So everything was with dictionaries. So my mom would tell the story. Well, he said something. I said yes, and next thing I know, I had a ring on my finger. And so my mom went, my mom's from the Transylvanian Valley of Hungary, Romania. Remember Count Dracula? My mom, as a young child, remembers being on a horse and buggy, and her mom said, go, don't ever go up to that hill, there's a bad guy there. That was Count Dracula. Zsa uh, Zsa Gabor, Eva Gabor, for some of the people, Dr. Ruth uh, Westheimer, they're all from that same area, they didn't know each other. So my mom went from Transylvania to Tel Aviv to Terre Haute. So that's a long story, I can tell more jokes, but I want to get more questions. <laughs> Any, any questions from this side? You guys are quiet. No? Oh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not that strong. Um, no, thanks. Um, how does 
Auschwitz look nowadays? Um, it looks very similar. So Auschwitz is really two camps, Auschwitz I and, and Birkenau, which is Auschwitz II. They're separated by three kilometers, or um, five kilometers, 3.1 miles. So it looks very similar. Um, Auschwitz I is where all the barracks were. It looks like a college campus, literally. And so you walk from building to building. Um, you would think you're on the set of Animal House. I mean, it's, it's, it's that perfect. Everything's perfect. And um, there's a sign that says Arbach Mach Free, which works means freedom. Everything is as is. Um, and that was not destroyed. Um, there's a barracks there where my mom, um, there's a huge picture, probably as big as the Go Dogs, huge picture, and it's my mom's liberation picture. If you ever see a liberation video from Auschwitz, there's little kids in a line. Those are all the Mengele twins. My mom always liked attention from her birth until her death. Um, and so she put my mom and my aunt at the front of the line. So when you see these little kids walking, that's my mom and my aunt at the front of the line. So in one of the barracks, there is a um, picture of my mom. So Auschwitz II, Birkenau, is where all the barracks were. Those were all destroyed by the Nazis. My mom's barracks, there's a plaque there, but it's virtually any of the barracks that are, they were all reconstructed. But you can see the, 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 um, the, the, the um, selection platform where my mom remembers last seeing her parents. She can see the tower, the guard tower, and it's vast. It's miles. It's, it's huge. I, I, I don't think I've been to the entire, it's like multiple football fields. I mean, it's, it's huge. So um, it's, it's um, like I said, I've been there 20 times. I think we're going hopefully next summer. Um, my, the last time I was there was January 2020. It was the first time I was there without my mom. Uh, so it was a little difficult. Um, I'm really not that strong, so I think the caffeine's helping me. Um, but, um, but thank you for your comments. So we have 12 minutes, so I think we have at least three more questions. If not, I'll go to my comedy routine. No? Oh, yes, yes. What was my parents' reaction when they told me that they were in the Holocaust? You have smart kids here, my goodness. So, um, I was very young, and so, you know, I can remember being, particularly I was telling um, um, Tama and some other people last night, I was seven years old, and I probably knew some of the stories when I was seven. By the time I was 10, 11, or 12, I knew all the stories. So. And I think it's important because, and I'll tell you why in a second, but as, as young children, our parents would tell us, particularly more my mom than my dad. My dad didn't really talk about his experience as much until 1978, I was 17, 18. Um, but my mom was very smart, and she didn't want to keep her past a secret. I didn't understand why, I didn't know, but I can remember the best way I can answer that is my sister's two years younger than me, she's five years old, I was seven. And very middle class neighborhood and so my our next door neighbor Mrs. Baker had a had a daughter same age as my sister so one day uh, Mrs. Baker uh, I think she had prepared for some food and she was doing her dishes and my sister's over there and she said oh Mrs. Baker how come you don't have a number like my mommy well Mrs. Baker's not a holocaust survivor not Jewish but she's smart she said uh Rena you might want to go and ask your mommy that Oh, okay, Mrs. Baker. So she runs next door. Mommy, Mommy, how come Mrs. Baker doesn't have a number like you? So my mom, being very smart, um, she's not going to go into great detail, but she wants to give her a response. And she said, well, remember, your dad and I told you and Alex that bad, th bad people did bad things to us. Yeah, I remember that, Mommy. Well, one of those bad things that they did was put a number on my, on my arm. Oh, okay, Mommy. And she ran back, and that was a good answer. And so, as we got older, we learned more. Um, about every couple of years, we would go to Israel. My mom's twin lived in Israel, and my dad's older brother lived in Israel. So we were always surrounded. Anytime we went to Israel, it was all Holocaust survivors. And it wasn't like we talked just about the Holocaust, but you would hear stories, and particularly by the late 70s, early 80s, as my mom started looking for answers, we would talk more and more about it. So, I mean, I knew most of the stories by the time I was 10 to 14 years old. And I think it's important because years later, 
I was in my 30s and I had just moved to Denver, Colorado. Most of the Mangala kids, most of the Mangala twins, their kids were my age, because most of the Mangala twins during World War II were aged 3 to 16. Most other survivors were older than my father, so their kids would be 10 to 15 years older than me. So I was in Denver and I went to a meeting to meet some people. It was, all, it was a meeting for second generation is what we, we call ourselves, Sec, two Gs or second generation. So I thought, oh, it would be a good way to meet people that have a lot of things in common with me. So I go to this meeting, and each person was told to stand up. There were about 20-some people in the room. I'll never forget it. Each person in the room had tried to commit suicide. So it comes to me, and I, I had just survived cancer. And really, for me, I always thought that surviving cancer made, was made much easier by my parents' past. So I said, well, you know, I think I'm a little bit of the odd person out here. I've never thought about committing suicide. In fact, I would tell you that my parents' past has served as a source of strength and perseverance for me. And they all looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, you know, I survived cancer. I was made easier by my parents' past. And I learned that what had happened was these kids, their parents were older. They didn't want to tell their kids their past. So when they were younger, the children, these now are adults, but these children would ask their parents a question. They would never get the answer. And my sister and I would get answers, maybe a very simplistic elementary level, but we would get answers. And I did a lot of reading. There's a book called by Helen Epstein called Children of the, of the Holocaust. And that definitely was borne out that I think instead of these parents trying to help their children, they actually made it worse. And as a result, they always felt guilt. And there's something called post-traumatic stress for some of the second generation. And I think for me, you know, people say, you know, that everybody has issues. I tell people I'm relatively issue free. And I think it's a lot because, at least from my mind, it's because my parents were very open with their past. So hopefully I answered your question a long way. Thanks. Yes, yes. I can't hear you. Strong with my religion. So, um, you know, I'm Jewish. It, it is me, you know, for me it's more of a cultural thing. Quite frankly, as I get older and I've lost my parents, it might become a little bit more spiritual, more religious. Um, I don't go to temple every week, um, but I do believe in God. And I think that, um, you know, that's important. My mom, you know, a lot of my thoughts, beliefs, and strength has come from my mom, and my mom for years would say, you know, that she was not religious, but she was always Jewish. In the last couple of years of life, she kind of started thinking she became a little bit of re religion started to enter in her life. And so I think for me, it's kind of the same thing. Um, and so I don't, you know, I'm, I think I'm more spiritual than religious, but I think things may be, you know, changing a little bit for me, but thank you. Any other questions? You guys are very, very bright. I'm almost scared to ask if you have any more questions because you guys are pretty tough. Alex, over there. Yes, yes. Oh, okay, yes. A big part of your mom's story was her forgiveness to what the Nazis or some of the Nazis did for Have you forgave them? Man, you guys are good. So, um, so if you watch the movie, Eva 7063 there's a comment that I say that I had trouble with forgiveness. I don't have any trouble with forgiveness. I think for, you know, I thought a lot about this. When, at, when the first movie came out, which is called Forgiving Dr. Mangala, I thought, oh, I know the whole story. It's no big deal. And people would ask me, what are your thoughts? Can you forgive the Nazis? You know, I, can, I have definitely allowed forgiveness to enter into my life. I think it's important. It's an important tool for everyone. I, you know, I think I've met children of Nazis. I've met Nazis. I met Dr. Mooch. So I think it's definitely something for me that I can forgive somebody that hurt my mom or hurt my dad. So if it's personal, yes, I can forgive. I'm not going to give you a blanket statement that I can forgive every person that was a Nazi because I don't think I think you have to have a direct connection. My direct connection is through my parents. So. And I'm going to answer this in a little different way. So my dad, we would have arguments at the dinner table, maybe not arguments, discussions. My mom believed in forgiveness. My dad didn't believe in forgiveness so much. 
So my dad was, is, was a big basketball fan, huge sports fan. So one of his favorite players about seven, eight years ago was Dirk Nowitzki. Dirk Nowitzki is a German basketball player. So my dad loved Dirk Nowitzki. So one day my dad says, you know what? I'm going to forgive Dirk Nowitzki and his family. I said, okay, how's that going to go? Well, probably his grandparents could have been Nazis. So my dad has a big press conference in Terre Haute. It's covered. And he just wanted in his own way, and he allowed forgiveness to enter into his life. To his dying day, he had Dirk Nowitzki jersey in his room. In fact, I still have it. I have to get it. Um, and so, you know, I think, and even um, there was a, a Nazi guard, Bruno Dey, D-E-Y. He was a guard at Sturthof, which was one of the subcamps that my dad was in. My dad did not know Bruno Dey. Bruno Dey was on trial almost two years ago. And so uh, my dad was of sound mind and body until maybe a month ago. And so uh, July 2020, early July 2020, um, we have a family friend who's an attorney in Germany, and he was representing any of the prisoners of Stutthof. And they wanted to know if my dad would, what his response would be. Would he want Bruno Day put in jail? Bruno Day was his age. I think they were both 94 at the time. So I didn't know what my dad would say, and so we prepare, We talked to him, and I said, Dad, this is what's going on. There's a trial. Do you want him to be punished? Do you want him to be put in prison? And essentially, his response was, no, I want to honor my, mom, my wife, Eva, my mom, and I want to forgive him. So he signed a document of forgiveness July 2020, a little over a year ago. And um, I, don't, I think Bruno Day, I think he did not serve time, but I don't know if it was due to my dad's statement or not. So I think we have a couple minutes. I don't know how much time we have. Yes? Have you ever had a direct conversation with a Holocaust denier? And if so, or if so, how did you respond? Or how do you think you would respond? My goodness. Um, have, I ever had a have I ever had a conversation with a Holocaust denier, and how did I respond? Um, Okay, yes. The answer is yes. So I can remember I was very young. I was a young podiatrist practicing in southern Indiana, and I had a patient that came in. He said, ah, I hear you're a Jew boy. I go, and I'm always, you know, I'm relatively non-confrontational. I said, John, I remember his name, John, I'm, I am Jewish. We don't, us people, we don't like to be called Jew boys. I said, I am Jewish, and he said, well, that means you're going to take all my money. And I said, you know what, John? I said, for the next three visits, he was a diabetic. I'm not going to charge you. He goes, what do you mean? I go, well, to prove a point, I want to prove to you a point that you have this, obviously, a stereotype of us Jewish people. He said, well, you can't do that. I said, I can do anything I want. I said, I'm not going to charge you as long as you agree to keep an open mind. So that was really one of my first interactions. Um, yes. Um, I've had multiple as, um, in uh, July, no, January 2020 at Auschwitz in Poland, in Krakow, at the Jewish Community Center. We had a Holocaust denier in the audience, and that was interesting. Uh, my mom, just to kind of cut to the chase, when my mom would in any way run into uh, revisionist people that denied the Holocaust, she would always, always in her purse, always have the document that Dr. Mood signed that said that there was a Holocaust. And she would say, I'm going to, she would, I'll sh I can always take that piece of paper out and shove it in their face. She, she would always, in fact, I still have the purse, and there, there's a document in there that still has. So how do I respond? I tell these stories, and I say, look, um, you know, it happened. And I'll give you one other story. Um, the former president of Iran, Ahmadinejad, I always mispronounce his name, he denied, said there was no Holocaust. So about seven years ago, my mom created a video and sent him an email, truth, sent him an email, and she invited him to come with us to Auschwitz, the president of Iran, and said, look, as you can see, I am alive, and this was filmed at Candles, and see behind me, that's me in the picture as a child. You can't deny that you see me now and that I want to invite you to Auschwitz. He actually responded, an email from the president of Iran, thank you for your offer, I will consider. We never heard back. But so my mom would go out of her way to try to combat anti-Semitism, Holocaust revisionists, Holocaust deniers. Um, I think we're probably toward the end. And I really want to thank you. Uh, this has been very special for me. And I know it's a little past 9 o'clock. But um, 
Thank you very much, and uh, keep your... Thank you. Thanks.